Hello, everybody. We'll get started in just a minute. Thanks for joining us here tonight. And while we are logging in, there's a poll. So go ahead and let me know a little bit of information about you while you're logging in. Go ahead and take a look at this poll. Helps me to know where your folks are from. Thank you to those of you that are doing it. Okay, looks like it's seven o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, and it looks like we have the majority of folks here tonight are in a suburban situation with less than half an acre of property. A lot of people have some native plants on their property already. And we do have a few people who are like, hey, what is a native plant? So we will make sure to cover everything from the very beginning as well. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop that. All right, and then we're gonna get started. Um, <clears throat> thanks for joining us here tonight. My name is Sarah McHale. I am the Community Engagement Specialist with the Land Conservancy of McHenry County. We are a nonprofit land trust located about an hour or so northwest of um, Chicago. So we're in Illinois, right near the Wisconsin and Illinois border. What a land trust does is we like to preserve and take care of land um, as well as supporting the landowners who, who want to do that as well. And we do that through education, through conservation easements. So anybody who wants to preserve their land forever, we work with them on that. Um, <clears throat> we do lots of restoration on sites that we own, as well as we help municipalities out with that. So lots of different things that we're doing. Um, and we are not unique in that. Land trusts across the country are doing the same thing. So if you are not located here in McHenry County and you're somewhere else, I highly suggest that you find your local land trust by going to a website that's literally called findalandtrust.org. <laughs> so findalandtrust.org, type in your zip code and it'll point you to your closest land trust. And you know what? Reach out to them. Um, just get on their e-newsletter list, find out how you can volunteer, become a member, whatever it is, go to a program of theirs. Um, we do the work we do as a nonprofit through member support. So all land trusts appreciate engagement and support from their community. All right, tonight, we're going to be talking all about pollinators, birds, and how your yards can support those things. If you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box. I will go through that at the end. Okay, I'm not gonna look through the chat. I'm gonna look in the Q&A box. All right, perfect. So go ahead and put it in there. Um, so this is really exciting because it's Earth Day today. And we're talking about this extremely simple thing that you can do that can make an impact on so many levels. And that's literally just putting these plants in your yard and um, you're gonna support a whole different variety of life as well as absorbing storm water and trapping carbon down in the soil. There's like all these things that happen when you put these plants in your yard. And this picture here is a beautiful picture of tiger swallowtail on Liatris or blazing star. Um, and this particular kind of Liatris is called Liatris spicata. Okay, so to begin, what is a pollinator? So pollinator, you can see a picture of this, this little bee here. Um, a pollinator is literally any creature that moves pollen grains from one flower to another, all right? 
And so pollination occurs and it's kind of this like accidental thing that happens when pollen grains mix together from different flowers, the same species, but two separate flowers. And that pollen grain falls down the correct tube and eventually um, a fruit is formed and then a seed is formed. This is an extremely simplified version of what actually happens. But this all happens thanks to creatures, insects mainly, but birds and bats in some parts of the world as well, um, who move this pollen around as they are, they are crawling around in the flower, usually searching for um, either pollen or nectar, okay? And I don't think I have a slide for it, but what is a native plant? A native plant is um, a plant that's been growing in a certain region for thousands of years with no human intervention. So that, um, that could be an, an example of that. And we're gonna go through a ton of examples of them tonight, but let's say we have a certain kind of grass and a certain kind of flower, like we've got prairie drop seed and butterfly weed that have grown together in our prairies for thousands of years with no, no human intervention. So we're not planting the plants, they've just grown here. They've evolved and grown here. Those are native plants. A non-native plant is a plant that um, was introduced to a region um, that hasn't grown there and hasn't developed those relationships over thousands of years. And a lot of times that happens um, due to people. So we move plants around from other regions of the globe um, for agricultural purposes or to look pretty in our yards. The problem with that, and some of them are problems and some of them aren't. So some of them become invasive. They grow crazy, they go out of control. They upset the balance that has happened with our native plants. Um, the other problem is that those plants haven't necessarily evolved a relationship with our native pollinators. So it's not just the plants that have lived in a certain region for thousands of years, but the insects and other wildlife too have, um, have lived with them as well and they've developed certain relationships. So if you really want to support pollinators and birds and all kinds of other things, you're going to be putting these native plants in your yard, all right? And we'll talk more at the end about like, how do I find out what is a native plant? Um, I'll just tell you right now. There's a specific website you can go to called bonap.org, B-O-N-A-P.org. And you can type in the name of a plant and find its native range. Um, and that's if it's native to North America, okay? And you can find its range, its native range down to the county level. So you could really geek out about it and be like, oh my gosh, I only want plants that are native to McHenry County. <laughs> and so they'll tell you that, which is pretty cool. All right. So what do pollinators get out of pollination? Why do they care? Well, a lot of times they're looking for nectar, um, which contains sugar. So that's a huge energy boost for them, which is especially important to things like this monarch butterfly here who migrates long distances from um, sections of Southern Canada all the way down to central Mexico where they overwinter. And you could see that tube there, that long kind of straw-like tube that uncoils from their mouth. It's called a proboscis. And that's how they extract this sugary, it's basically sugar water kind of out of the flower. And they also, some insects collect pollen um, from certain kinds of plants. And a lot of times the pollen is going to be used to feed their young. And pollen, nobody, nobody thinks about this, but pollen actually has a lot of really good nutritious things in it, proteins, fats, minerals. And not all pollen is created equal. So I'm sure you guys have all seen the memes that go around on the internet about leave the dandelions. They're the only 
blooming plants to feed the bees in the early spring. And that's just not true. There's a lot of native plants that bloom in the early spring right now that actually have pollen content that's more high, it's higher in protein, higher in fat, higher in minerals than a non-native, like a dandelion, okay? So don't fall for all of these kind of just little internet things, but pollen is really important and especially pollen from our native plants. The other reason um, that this is an important topic is because a lot of our pollinator, their numbers are declining along with birds as well. Um, so things like our monarch butterflies have declined by 80%. Um, we have the rusty patched bumblebee, which is an in federally endangered species of bee. 95% um, decline in its population. Um, birds, so, and this is like a very general thing, but all kinds of different birds have um, declined. The average is 29% since 1970. Obviously that's much higher for certain species. Um, why is this happening? Habitat loss, chemical use, and a lot of competition from non-native wildlife and plants. All right, so these are all different things that you can help with, all right? And this is so timely to be talking about this on Earth Day because it's not all doom and gloom. There's a lot that you as a homeowner can do. So we wanna put these native plants in, all right? Plants to provide food, for insects and birds. So whether that's in the form of nectar, pollen, berries, or insects. Now, and I think I'm gonna talk about this, so I don't wanna go into it too much, but a lot of these plants um, are host plants for butterflies. That means the butterflies can lay their eggs on them, which results in caterpillars, which results in very nutritious food for birds. All right. These plants also provide shelter. So places to hide and nest and, you know, just get cover. Um, chemical free zone. So native plant gardens don't require a lot of extra fertilizer. All right. That's they require no fertilizer. <laughs> In fact, I was telling somebody today, you don't even want to put compost on top of your native plant garden. You don't need to do that unless it's like an extreme situation with crazy um, compaction or something. But 95% of the time, you're not going to top dress it with compost. You're not going to use any kind of fertilizer. Um, the plants do the best. You choose the plants that are right for your current soil, okay? And, and they're going to flourish. Um, you generally don't need to use any insecticides or anything. I've never used any kind of insecticide control in a garden. Um, these gardens are hosts to a huge diversity of different kinds of insects that all eat each other <laughs> and they keep each other under control generally. Um, and they just provide a lot of beauty as well. And native plants can be appropriate um, for you know, as manicured of a, of a yard as you want it to be, or they can be as wild and crazy as you want it to be. It's all how you manage your specific garden. All right, so let's get into an example of a full sun garden um, that would be a great, uh, have a bunch of great host plants and nectar plants for different kinds of insects, especially monarch butterflies. Um, here's the secret though, you guys, like they call them monarch way stations, these little gardens here, all kinds of insects like these. It's not just the monarchs. <laughs> um, and the reason, so this is a, this is a specific garden design that was designed by Ringers Landscaping for the Barrington Area Conservation Trust. This is a, this is just an example people always freak out about what's the layout of my garden. What does it have to be? Honestly, it's not so much about the layout as it is about the plants that you choose for your space. And there's some plants that are appropriate for small spaces 
And there's others that um, are appropriate for larger spaces, you know? So in a small garden, some of these are really good choices, okay? So things like the swamp milkweed and the butterfly weed, A and B there, um, those are both really pretty well-behaved plants. So they're not going to spread super aggressively and they are milkweeds. So they're in the Asclepius family. So they're milkweeds. That means that monarch butterflies are able to lay their eggs on the leaves of these plants. And then <clears throat> those eggs hatch into tiny little caterpillars and they're able to eat those leaves. And then they turn into butterflies, whatever. They go through the whole metamorphosis cycle. So if you want to support a monarchs, having milkweed in your garden is really important. There's a ton of other insects that love milkweeds as well. Plus these two plants, milk, uh, the butterfly weed and the swamp milkweed, they're just gorgeous. And in spite of the name swamp milkweed, that can tolerate, it does not have to be in a swamp. <laughs> that can tolerate like medium dryness soil, all right? It doesn't have to be where it's wet all the time, although it does do really wet, do really well in wet situations. Um, some other plants in here that I'm really happy that they included in this design are things like prairie drop seed, which is letter I. That is that finely textured fountainy thing of beauty in front there. Um, every garden should include grasses or sedges. Um, this garden is a sun garden. It's a little bit larger. Grasses are appropriate for here. Prairie drop seed is gorgeous, okay? And it's used in the most formal landscapes as well as just, you know, out in giant prairies. Um, it's a grass that has a really nice mound-like fountain kind of form to it. Um, I can't say enough about how beautiful it is. I like to dot them throughout the entire garden and especially in the front. I think that they make a really nice contrast with things like that butterfly milkweed there. So I like to have them dotted as a matrix throughout the entire planting with these like flowers stuck in between them. And people don't often think of grasses as pollinator supporters, but they are. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit too. Um, some other things that are great for a small garden like this are pale purple coneflower. That's a really nice, well-behaved one. That is letter D. If you can find that, it's over towards the left where it's labeled. Um, pale purple coneflower, Echinacea pallida. That's, that's the one that is native here in McHenry County. And then there's also Echinacea purpurea, which is just purple coneflower. That one's native to a larger area. Um, there is a liatris in here, which is nice. F, letter F, the prairie blazing star. Every garden should have some kind of liatris in it. Um, they're pretty well behaved. They're absolutely beautiful. They need a lot of competition though. They need, so these plants, can you notice, there are not large expanses of mulch in between these plants. They're crammed in there. That is what we want. We don't want like three feet of open mulch in between individual plants. We want the plants to be the mulch. That's going to hold moisture in, it's going to suppress weeds, and it's going to give lots of shelter for insects, which is great. Um, some other of my favorites in here for small gardens. Um, I like Rattlesnake Master L in a small garden. That one has a really kind of unique architectural feel to it. Some suggestions that I would add to this garden are things like a shrub um, for some different root structure and some year round interest. That's the other thing that the grasses do, which is really nice. Some, um, I would also add an aster. I'm gonna show you some asters and then there's a couple plants in here that I think are pretty aggressive for a small space, and I wouldn't use them in a small space. I have them out in large areas, um, but things like Joe Pie, that can quickly overwhelm a small garden, and it'll seed all over the place, and I wouldn't put it in a small garden. So can that wild bergamot, letter G, um, that could be pretty crazy, along with the mountain mint. So these are all fantastic plants 
huge pollinator supporters, but if you don't have the space for it, if you're just doing like a little 10 by 10 garden or something, or, you know, even just a little 20 by 20 garden, those are going to be um, a little aggressive for that kind of space. All right. So let's talk about some of my favorites um, for even small gardens, okay? Or they can go along the edge of a larger garden or along a sidewalk or something, prairie smoke. So this is blooming right now. And it looks like the picture on the right there where you see the bee dangling, that's what it looks like right now. Beautiful, okay? Huge bee supporter. So bees, um, the bees, the bumblebees that are out right now are the insects that are able to get pollen out of these um, and nectar too. If they, I, you know what, I don't know for sure if they're nectaring out of these. I would have to look that up. But what they do, these bumblebees are strong enough to kind of pry apart the bloom and crawl up inside there and they shake their bodies. It's called sonication. They just like shake and vibrate and it dislodges the pollen grains. Um, and you can see a little pollen patch or pollen pouch there, that little orange ball on that bumblebee. Um, these are phenomenally beautiful. I mean, they're under a foot tall. So they're great in like an edge situation along a sidewalk or whatever. Um, and then in, in about a month, so late May, early June, they're going to develop these kind of smoky, um, wispy little parts of their seeds. It's called akines um, that gives it this really ethereal kind of look. So when people are like, hey, dandelions are the only source for insects, like, no, put things in <laughs> like prairie smoke. And butterfly milkweed. So I touched on this one already. And there's a little picture of the monarch caterpillar, which is really cool. Look for those, those black, white, yellow stripes on there. Um, butterfly milkweed, if you've got some sun. So when I say sun, I mean more than like five hours of direct sun. People are always like, what does that mean? When? When is the five hours? Talking in like the middle of the summer between the hours of like 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. Are you getting at least five hours of direct sun? If so, butterfly weed will be great for that. Um, it stays short, it's not insanely aggressive, and it holds onto its blooms for a long time. And it's very showy and beautiful. And mine are covered in caterpillars all the time. I love it. Tons of insects get nectar from it as well. And then it's important for pollinators that we have um, sources of nectar and pollen from spring to fall, okay? So we don't just want everything blooming in June or July. Like we need things blooming from April through beginning of October. So um, I just went through three. Here's the third aromatic aster. This is a, this is a, uh, fall bloomer, so late September, early October, depending on the weather. Um, I love this plant. It's very showy and it's it has a mound-like habit to it, which I like. There's a lot of asters um, in a garden can get really leggy, not so nice looking, especially when they're not blooming. Aromatic aster though, almost has a shrub-like appearance to it and it stays under three feet. And it is covered in pollinators at the end of September. It's wonderful. Word of warning about aromatic aster. It's an, it's, it's an aggressive spreader, okay? This is gonna spread by rhizomes, which are just like these underground, they look like threads kind of but thicker. Um, and they really spread and occupy bare soil. So what I do with them is I'll sandwich them in between some of the bunch grasses, like that prairie drop seed I showed you, and their roots run into that and they just stop, which is great. Or I just let them go crazy and colonize an entire area. Perfect. Then I don't need to put more plants in there. Here's some of the, okay, so these are two of the bunch grasses. So like these are examples that I would sandwich 
those aggressive rhizome spreaders in between. Um, so we've got prairie drop seed on the left, which is basically my favorite grass and it's amazing. And then we've got little blue stem on the right, which turns that beautiful copper color um, in like fall, winter. So talk about multiple season interest, these grasses. And even the prairie drop seed is really pretty in the winter too. It's kind of this like yellowy golden color, um, really nice. So for, you know, multiple season interest and the flowers don't really look like much. Um, little blue stem, pollinator supporter, those little skippers, you can see that picture down on the right there. It's not a butterfly, it's not a moth, technically it's a skipper, whatever. Um, they lay their eggs on those little blue stems and they're, once the eggs hatch into a little larva or caterpillar, they are able to eat those little blue stems, which is great. That's what we want. So some of these insects have specialist relationships with some plants. So that means they can only eat certain types of plants. They can't just land on your hostas and lay their eggs and their egg, their little larva can eat your hostas. No, okay, we need a diversity of plants to be able to support a diversity of insects. Let's talk about shade. What time is it? I'm doing good. Okay, let's talk about some shade gardens here. Um, these can be for small spaces. These can be for large spaces. Right now in the spring, you guys, if you have any healthy woodlands near you, get out and take a walk because spring is the showcase time in the woods. This is when all of these little wildflowers are blooming and it is so fun to lay on the ground in the woods and watch the little pollinators go crazy and all these delicate little wildflowers. Things like Jacob's Ladder, which, um, is blooming in some of my sunny areas right now in my shady areas, it's not blooming so much yet. So Jacob's Ladder can do shade, it can do sun, like it's pretty adaptable. Um, wild Strawberry, I'm gonna show you an up close picture of that. I'm obsessed with that plant. If you've seen any of my webinars, you're sick of hearing me talk about it. Um, it's a great ground cover, okay? And as well as Wild Ginger, which, let's see, yes. Right now it has a cool little kind of red flower that sits on the ground. It's really neat. So on the left, you could see an up close picture of what wild strawberry looks like in the fall. Um, the more sun it gets, the brilliant, the more brilliant the red is. If it's in a shady location, it's just a little bit more muted of a red. Um, spreads by runners. So that means it's like, it's prolific. So this stuff is gonna spread great for you. I don't know, that whole patch spread from like four wild strawberries and I let it. And it is a fantastic ground cover. It does not smother other plants from being able to grow up amongst it. That is key for me with the ground cover, okay? Because I like diversity in my gardens, all different kinds of plants. It is also a huge pollinator supporter, all right? Not only can things, um, get nectar and pollen out of its flowers. And obviously animals are able to eat the strawberries and you can eat the strawberries too, but lots of little butterflies and moths are able to lay their eggs on the leaves and then their caterpillars can eat them. That's what we want. So later in the season, some of my strawberry leaves, they look a little chewed up. You know, they might have some little holes in them. To me, that's a success. I know then, right, that it's working. <laughs> My plants are supporting things. That's what I want. Um, the wild ginger is really sweet looking with its little heart-shaped leaves. That one grows pretty densely, um, but slowly. So not an aggressive spreader. That one definitely needs shade. That strawberry can do shade or sun. It can do either. And the little Jacob Slatter, so beautiful and delicate. And it will seed around, but like, go for it. Seed around, who doesn't want that to seed all over the place? All of these plants are so short and so low under a foot. And some other examples, um, things like wild geranium, which is the light purple plant there towards the back. 
and the bishop's cap in the front. Now, both of these are examples of specialist relationships with those two different types of bees that you see there, the andrenas on the wild geraniums and the holiptid species of bees on the bishop's cap. That means that they are only going to be getting nectar or pollen, whatever it is, from that specific type of plant. So when you put plants in that support these specialist insects, that is amazing, okay? Because you're going to be supporting the specialist insects along with the generalist insects that are like, I can get nectar from anything. My mouth parts match up with all different kinds of plants. So you put these plants in and unknowingly, you're gonna be supporting all different kinds of specialists, which is really cool. Okay, so let's talk about some shrubs because shrubs, and I feel like we've kind of left birds out. So like, let's get some birds in here. Shrubs are like the best bird feeder as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> You don't necessarily need to put bird feeders out if you've got a good diversity of native shrubs in your in your yard. And serviceberry is such a sweet example of a beautiful shrub that is also okay. It's flowering right now here in northern Illinois, anyway. Um, gorgeous as a specimen tree or shrub, right? I mean, who doesn't want to look at that? Um, everybody plants like magnolias or those crazy invasive Bradford Cleveland calorie pears for their blooms. Like, how about a native service berry? Look at that. And you're also going to be supporting all kinds of different things. Birds are obsessed with service berries <laughs> and love them. They eat the berries. You can eat the berries too. Service berries are really good, just picked right off the tree. I almost regret teaching my kids that because now they just eat all the berries. Um, they're also a good nesting shrub. They can get 20-ish feet tall or so, so they get kind of big. Um, good nesting site for certain kinds of birds. There's so many different kinds of birds that love them. This is a cedar waxwing here, but I mean, there's tons of them. Grosbeaks, tanagers, all different kinds of birds will flock to these service berries when the berries are there during the summertime. And not only are those flowers good for nectar and the berries are good for birds, but the leaves support all different kinds of butterflies and moths, such as this little guy right here. So this guy is able to lay its eggs on the leaves of service berries. Okay, and that's what its little caterpillar looks like. And it is able to eat the leaves, which is great. Now, a lot of times I get the question like, how do I know how many insects my um, whatever plant is supporting? And the National Wildlife Federation has a really cool um, native plant finder, it's called. And you can type in a plant name along with your zip code. And it's going to show you how many insects are supported by that plant in your zip code. And it, and it has to do with like how many different kinds of butterflies and moths are able to lay their eggs on that plant and use it as a host plant. And that's the important thing. Everybody thinks about the showy butterflies when they're adults and they're beautiful. But guess what? That butterfly starts off as a caterpillar that needs to eat something, right? So National Wildlife Federation Native Plant Finder, okay, is a great tool for you to use to find out more about exactly what are these high um, species supporting things. And I know this one talks about New Jersey tea, but I've got to get a plug in there for oak trees because oak trees, I know people are like, what? I don't have room for that in my garden. If you have space for an oak tree in your yard, that's like the biggest pollinator supporter of all. Those support, I don't know, over four or 500 different kinds of insects, which is amazing. 
All right, New Jersey tea, back down to the like little tiny garden level here. New Jersey teas are beautiful and support a ton of different kinds of pollinators. They are always covered in, um, I can't even tell you what these things are, but little tiny gnats to these ir beautiful iridescent blue wasps to beetles to, you know, bees and flies, and it's just covered these white blossoms at the end of June, beginning of July. They stay under four feet or so, which is really nice. Um, here's the thing about these New Jersey teas, though, you guys. They're a little fussy. Okay, for one thing, rabbits love to eat the heck out of them. So if you've got a rabbit problem, cage them or whatever. Um, sometimes they also just randomly don't grow for, I don't know what reason. So, <laughs> so what I, I think, I think they're a little finicky with the type of soil. So they really, really like dry gravelly soil. I have it here just planted in medium loamy, normal black topsoil. It might be a little too rich for this plant. Um, and they just kind of fade out sometimes. And then other times, other years, they'll just randomly re-sprout and come back. So just keep that in mind. So what I do with this, this lovely finicky shrub is I just put it in a place where it's not a focal point. And so if it doesn't come back that year, whatever, it's covered up by other plants. And then the years where it does come back, perfect, awesome, let's celebrate it. All right, so another thing in your gardens that's actually really important for insects and birds is dead wood. And we always forget about this, but there are so many different kinds of beetles and bees and wasps and tons of things that use dead wood. They will bore into it. They will live underneath it. They will lay their eggs inside of it. Extremely cool um, what a dead thing can do to support the environment. So there's different cool ways of you can incorporate decorative dead wood into your gardens, leave some of it laying around in your woods if you've got some. Um, you don't have to go crazy, you don't have to go overboard, it doesn't have to be like solid dead wood everywhere. Don't feel bad about getting rid of some, but leave it as it works for your garden if you're able to. Okay, now let's touch on maintenance. Um, all right, so. People have this impression of native plant gardens that they are low maintenance. And I'm here to tell you that that is not true. <laughs> not for the first three years, they're not low maintenance. They're just as high maintenance as any other kind of garden. Um, there's some tips though, to make them a little bit less maintenance. Things like planting really densely, when you do plant your garden. So we recommend at least one plant per square foot. Um, if you can do that, if you're like, I can't afford to do that, that's a lot, because that is, I mean, that's a lot of money. Plant in pods, you know, just plant in like densely planted pods and those plants will, you know, spread out. It's your job to keep the weeds down, all right? And I use a couple different tools for that regularly. I'll use a hoe. So either a stand-up hoe, like that long one there, that's a Dutch hoe, or that small little handheld one. The, the tall Dutch hoe, that's useful for, especially new gardens where there's a little bit more space in between the plants. Um, that little handheld one, I use that for my dense, mature gardens where I'm able to get in and do really fine work. I am not pulling weeds by the root. Um, that causes soil disturbance and that causes more weeds to germinate, okay? Weed seeds love when the soil is all disturbed and they're like, woohoo, light, water, whatever, yay, I'm gonna grow like crazy. So it might seem counterintuitive, but don't pull these weeds by the roots. Use a hoe, get in there and just knock them out real fast. You're gonna slice them just below the soil surface, okay? Um, it's funny when I tell this to people and then like 
they'll email me a couple months later and they'll be like, so I've been doing that and it's so fast. <laughs> it's so much easier. And I'm like, I know, isn't it crazy? That's the other thing is you're more likely to get out and do it and do the weeding because it's so fast with the, with a hoe, as opposed to you using a trowel and like wrestling and digging that old root out. Um, some other examples of ways to make these pollinator gardens kind of neighborhood friendly are to maintain a neat edge, whether that's a cut edge or a mowed edge, whatever you want to do. Don't let the plants go insane and be like flapping all over outside of them. This is if you care, you know, if you want to maintain a look. If you don't care, let the plants flap. Um, some other things you can do are leaving your leaves and leaving your stems over the winter and into the spring. So leaves are fantastic. You can just cover your garden beds in leaves. Um, there's all kinds of insects that are actually, especially moths, who make their cocoons sometimes attached to dead leaves, right? So if you're just like shipping away all your dead leaves or shipping away pollinators. So just kind of scatter them um, on your garden beds and leave them there over the winter. Stems, lots of different insects nest inside stems or over winter inside stems. So if we cut all of our perennial plant stems down to the ground in November, you are literally getting rid of all kinds of insects, little tiny bees mainly, that could be overwintering inside those stems. Leave your stems over the winter, at least 15 inches of stem stubble should be left. Um, and don't rip that stubble out now either in the spring because there's still insects inside there and they all kind of emerge at different times. People are always like, when is it okay for me to clean up my garden? And there isn't a simple answer because people say like, oh, it's when it's over 50 degrees consistently. And that's just not true because there's tons of different kinds of insects and they have all different life cycles. Some of them aren't gonna emerge until summer. So just leave, your, leave that 15 inches of stem stubble all the time. Don't ever get rid of it eventually the plants are going to grow up around that. So you don't even see it. And honestly, this is an example at, in Chicago at Lurie Garden. This is an extremely like manicured, formal, internationally designed situation in the middle of Chicago here. Um, they're leaving those stems. They leave all the cut stems at 15 inches. It gives it a uniform look. It's not messy looking at all, all right? And they have some cool informational signage to explain why. Here's an example of a little bee who is using that stem um, to nest. So this is spring or summer. And this is a picture by Heather Holm, who I'm gonna have some of her book titles at the end on a resource slide. She is fantastic if you wanna learn more about pollinators. And here's another one. Here's how we can tell that that stem is being used by a bee. You look for the little, I call it sawdust. You look for the little um, like excavated pieces of the stem that the little bee has chewed out, all right, and is using. And you'll know, hey, the stem is being used right now by a bee. It's kind of cool. This makes you look closely at your gardens, um, it's a fun way to kind of interact with your yard. All right, so we have a program called Conservation at Home, and this is also run by lots of other land trusts through Illinois and other states as well. And what this program is, it's just a way to like support you in what you wanna do in your yard. So basically it's put some native plants in, start taking some invasives out, um, and that's really what it comes down to. We can come over and do a site visit and give you advice. Here's what plants I would put in. Um, here's help on identifying things. You know, we teach you how to do that. And the cost of the site visit includes a one-year membership to the Land Conservancy of McHenry County. That's how we want to help you, you know, and that's, that is also helping us as a nonprofit, that member support. 
And anytime you have questions, we encourage you to reach out. Now, people see this checklist and they're like, oh my gosh, I have to have all of those things done. No, you don't. I don't care if you don't have a single one of those things done. I'll come do a site visit for you. Okay. And then once you get some native plants going in your yard, I'll give you the sign. The sign is kind of a cool little way to talk to friends, family, whoever, UPS guy, about the benefit of native plants. Because if we all get these, a little patch going in our yard of native plants, you're going to make a difference. You're going to support things like that federally endangered rusty patch bumblebee. You're going to be supporting the monarch butterflies. You're going to be supporting birds, okay? We're able to find caterpillars to feed to their young. So if we all do something, and it doesn't have to be extensive, just literally put a few plants in the ground, will make a difference, okay? Which is very inspiring to hear, hopefully, on Earth Day. And here are some resources. So there's a ton of different places to buy native plants. I just listed a few for McHenry County, but mail order options of native plants um, are listed there. And those are native plants to the Midwest. And so, especially Prairie Moon Nursery, I love that website, um, just for like learning too. They list the range maps, the county, down to the county level native range maps for every plant. So you can just go in there and start tooling around learning about where exactly is the native range of certain plants. Um, Heather Holm, I showed you some of her pictures. She's got three different books. I own all three and I love them. <laughs> and I use them too, which is great. It's not just a sit on the bookshelf kind of book. I actually use them. Um, she's got one on bees and her newest one is on wasps. And then she's got, her first one is called Pollinators Native Plants, and it includes some garden designs in it, which is fantastic. If you don't follow her on social media, you should. Extremely educational, beautiful photography of really hard to photograph um, little insects. And then Doug Tallamy's book, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, Bringing Nature Home and his newest one, Nature's Best Hope. And he's got a new one out about oaks too. Um, which I want to get my hands on and read. And then there's lots of other places to find out information about native plants, like your local wild ones chapter. It's a national nonprofit with local chapters all across the country. Their goal, get native plants in people's yards. So they're a great source of information as well. Along here in Illinois and other states, I know people from other states use this website too. It's called Illinois Wildflowers. Um, and it's not just wildflowers, it's trees and shrubs and ferns and grasses and all kinds of things. That website is so informative. If you go to Illinois Wildflowers and you just type in one play, you type in purple cone flower, it's going to bring up really cool information about it along with what exact insects use that plant? Do they use it for nectar? Do they use it for pollen? Are they, are the caterpillars eating it? It tells you all of those faunal associations, which is really exciting. And then the, um, the Land Conservancy of McHenry County, we run a Facebook group called LEARN for Landowner Ecology and Restoration Network. It's a private group. It's moderated by us. We make sure nothing crazy is happening. I know social media gets a bad rap for that. It's a really great, encouraging place. People post their questions. What is this tree? You know, what is this plant? What should I do here in my garden? Or how do I handle this with my larger restoration, whether it's wetland, prairie, or woodland? And there's lots of knowledgeable landowners, ecologists, botanists who are going to jump on and help answer your questions. Um, yes. So with that, I am going to see what kind of questions we have in the Q&A box. Um, so go ahead and pop your questions in there now if you haven't. Oh, also guys, I should have said this at the beginning. I'm sorry. This recording is going to be emailed to you too, okay? Sometime tonight or tomorrow or something, I'll send it out. All right. Oh, mosquito spray. 
We live on a lake. The city sprays for mosquitoes in the summer. Can't get them to stop. What other insects will be affected? Lots of other insects are affected. Yeah, so, so it's any insects that come in contact with the spray itself, honestly. So yeah, mosquito spraying is a, is a tough one. And I don't have a good answer for that. I mean, there's some people who use larvicides and still, instead of the general broadcast aerial spray, a larvicide is basically like a little pellet or something that you put in water, which kills the larva of the mosquitoes um, because they start their life off in the water as like a little insect. It's like a little worm looking thing that scoots around in the water. And then it, they go through metamorphosis and they leave the water and fly around as an adult insect. Um, so some people will use a larvicide, which is more targeted than it's not broadcast spray. But I mean, it's not just targeted on mosquito larva, like it does affect other larva too. So there's no good answer. I'm sorry about the mosquito spray, unfortunately. Um, do deer and bunnies bother the grasses? No, they don't bother the grasses, like prairie drop seed and little blue stem. Nope, they don't, Donna, which is really nice. Um, so that's a common question, like what plants are deer and rabbits going to bother? Prairie Moon Nursery's website there, they have a deer filter, a deer resistance filter. So you can narrow down some of the plants that they're not going to eat. There's a ton that deer don't bother. Rabbits are a little bit harder. It all depends on like how hungry actually are they. You know, they don't like things that are like minty or citrusy or oniony. So there's all these different plants in these families that they don't bother. Um, will we be able to, yeah, sending it to you, Jessica, sending you the recording. Um, Will I be able to get these amazing pollinators to visit if all of my neighbors spray and treat their yards? So I'm surrounded by that right now. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah, you do. It's amazing, but you do. Um, so there's some tricks that you can do if overspray is a problem, you know, if they're really spraying improperly. So, spraying on a windy day or spraying too much or not spraying close enough to the ground. They're just like randomly broadcast spraying. Then drift can be an issue with herbicide um, or insecticide or whatever it is. It kills me when I see people like spraying their trees, you know, I'm like, oh my God, that's getting all over the place. So um, you can plant like some hedgerows some dense hedgerows, and that will help absorb some of the herbicide. Yes, it can have an impact on those shrubs too. Um, so it's really a hit or miss kind of thing. It depends on exactly what's being sprayed too. But, but site your gardens, try to be in the center, in the center of your property if possible, or somewhere where it's going to be sheltered. Maybe it's your house providing shelter from the actual drift of the spray, okay? That can be helpful. Oh, Barb, I'm right across from you on Dean Street. Nice, in that subdivision. So yeah, our office at the Land Conservancy is on Dean Street in Woodstock. And one of our attendees tonight is right across the street. So Barb, if you wanna set up a site visit or any of you wanna set up a site visit with me and you're here in McHenry County, just email me. My email is on the screen there and we'll set it up. Um, the fee includes a one-year membership to the Land Conservancy. It's $75. If you are not a member, if you are already a member, it's $35. Um, okay. I have milkweed seeds and wondering when to plant them. Uh, you can put them down now or honestly, you could wait until the fall. So milkweed likes uh, a cold period. A lot of our native plants do. So think about it these seeds, if they're out in nature and nobody's doing anything to them, right? They, a lot of them are held on into the fall, especially milkweeds. Um, 
those seeds are held on into the fall and they just kind of blow around, they land on the ground, and then they're there over the winter. And they kind of like fall down into cracks in the soil. And the winter, it snows on them, it's icy, it freezes, it thaws, the coating of the seed is getting really broken down. So milkweeds are ones that they need a cold dormancy period. I mean, you can put them out now. You just kind of surface broadcast them. You just That just means you throw them onto open bare soil. You're not going to see them for a few years, you know, show up. They don't just germinate immediately. Um, it can take a while for them to show up from seed. Um, or you can hang on to them and spread them next fall or winter. And then it'll still be a few years before you see them show up. And I have a whole webinar on collecting seeds and stuff. Perfect. All right. I don't see any other questions. I encourage people, you guys, if you have questions, reach out. I don't care if you're not here in McHenry County, reach out if you have questions. And if you need to get connected with another land trust and you can't find them, let me know. I'll help you. I'll help you find them. Okay, um, reach out, volunteer, just like get their e-newsletter, become a member, whatever it is. Oh, Sherry wants to know where, she, where can she get a Dutch hoe? Um, just Google it. I ordered it online. So that particular hoe, it doesn't have to be that one. Let me see if it, yeah, I can go back. It doesn't have to be this. Sneebauer, Royal Dutch Ho. <laughs> There's all different kinds of them. Like my, my friend likes one that's got like a diamond cutting blade on it. Um, just Google Dutch Ho and you'll find some, okay? Um, I don't even remember where I ordered this from. It was some company out of Tennessee or something that I got it from. And I got one for my mom too. She uh, broke her hip years ago and you know getting up and down is hard and so she's able to do her weeding standing up which is really nice okay let me see if there's any other questions your local garden center might carry one too let me see if there's any random okay somebody did put random questions in the chat prairie smoke aggressive and growth no i wish it was that would be amazing um yeah, people are like, yup, I had bergamot and mountain mint totally take over a garden. They will. You guys don't feel bad about editing out plants. That just means rip them out. If they're too plentiful, don't feel bad about doing that. Compost them, give them to somebody else, do whatever. Um, what was that site? I don't know what site you're talking about, Barb. Maybe the National Wildlife Federation site. That might be the one you're asking about. Um, National Wildlife Federation. Just Google National Wildlife Federation um, Native Plant Finder, okay? So Google that here, I'll put it in here. National Wildlife, All right? I'll, I'll email it out to you guys. This isn't working. <laughs> National, I don't like have a person doing this for me on the side, guys. This is me doing it. National <laughs> Federation Native Plant Finder. All right, Google that. I put it in the chat and you'll find it. And that's when you can like type your zip code in and stuff, okay? Um, oh, the other one, bonap.org. It's in the chat. That's the one where you can just go find the native ranges of all different kinds of plants, all right? So that's in the chat as well. Thank you, everybody for joining me tonight. I don't see any more questions. Um, you'll be emailed this recording, okay? And um, reach out with questions. Otherwise, everybody have a good night and a good Earth Day, right? Every day is Earth Day. But thank you so much. Everybody have a good night. Bye.